Good afternoon everyone, welcome along to the SFC interviews. Here with Kevin Locko today. So how are you doing mate, first of all? And I probably butchered your surname, so apologies if I have. No, you got it right, yeah. No, I'm all good, thank you. Thanks for having me on. Um, yeah, it's been a long time coming. We've had a, a few chats and stuff, but we're here now, so looking forward to having a little chat. And of course, uh, you know, we were just touching off stream there that you're currently with Harrogate Town as well. We'll, we'll kind of come into that first of all. And yeah. um, you're, uh, you know, sort of, you were just saying that um, you're, you're grateful to be out and about and, and been able to play and, and sort of train on a day-to-day basis because... Beforehand, when you were with uh, with Dover, you were doing all sorts of stuff, weren't you? You were just saying then. Yeah, so obviously when the pandemic came about, um, especially National League got hit really bad, uh, having not much protection from you know, the PFA and the FA, etc. So uh, stopped getting paid from the end of March uh, right through to, for me personally, till uh, when did I sign for Harrogate in August time, July, mm. August. Um, so I was having to drive vans and work for Amazon uh, jump on eBay, sell unwanted things just to get by, really. So it made me really appreciate, uh, you know, even just coming in every day to train for a few hours with meeting loads of boys and just having a good time. And uh, it really put things in perspective for me. I think little things now that would usually get me, you know, d- down or disappointed. Uh, mm-hmm. Now I just look in hindsight and think how I was feeling last summer. Um, and I was just saying to you back then, you know, obviously I've not been in the team at Harrogate, but um you know i've I've got a, a little da- a little daughter now who's three weeks old who keeps me busy um i'm still training keeps you awake, no doubt as well, I'm sure. keeps me awake yeah i've got i'm getting, <laughs> ba- I'm getting bags on my eyes for the first time in my life <laughs> like, um but yeah it, it could be a lot worse and it is a lot worse for a lot of people out there so i've got to be grateful and um try not to let my current circumstance um you know not being in the team affect me too much because like I just said, there's a lot of people out there who are struggling, you know, not getting paid, not even on furlough and stuff, and um, just have to be grateful, really, that I'm, you know, just kicking the ball around still for a living. And it's, it's um, during these times, it's precious. Absolutely, and uh, we'll sort of jump into when you signed for Stevenage now. And what was it about Stevenage that you know made you want to sign up with a football club? Uh, so I was playing at Maidstone. Uh, had a really good year at Maidstone in non-league, in uh, at national league level. I had my England C call up, so I had a really good year. Um, and then my agent at the time, he texted me. He um, mentioned that Glenn Roder, uh, rest his soul, he um, he came down to to watch me for a few weeks, um, and they were interested. Stephen is interested in signing me the following season. Okay. Um, yeah. So in uh, in pre-season. Uh, he come down for a few games again and liked what he saw and they offered me a deal. Um, the only <laughs> the only um, misunderstanding on my part, obviously, I think I was 20 or 21 at the time. Um, I've got the text from my agent saying, look, Stephen is going to sign you. They really like you. Um, so me, naturally, I'm buzzing. You know, I'm just thinking, yep, yeah, back into the Football League. Mm-hmm. Um, so on the day of signing, <laughs> um uh, I, I get another text and like I said, I'm 20, 21 years old and it's all a bit fast paced and stuff. Um, I get told that I'm going to go on loan straight away. Yeah. So it was a bit of a misunderstanding. Uh, I assumed that I'd done well enough at Maidstone to go to Stevenage and play. Um, with all due respect, it's only a league above and I thought, you know, that'd be a natural progression for me to go to Stevenage mm-hmm. and play week in, week out or challenge to play in week in, week out. Yeah. Uh, but, but actually, I'm going back on loan. Um, so, you know, but I, I got my head straight and I just thought, you, you know, look, let me just go on loan and smash it and do well and come back to Stevenage and hopefully play. Um, mm-hmm. Because ideally, look, it was a football league club. Uh, the setup, I've always known the setup at Stevenage was really good. The training ground's amazing. It's like championship sort of standard. Um, so I've gone in there, I've met all the boys and met the manager and it all seemed fine. And I was actually excited just to just to go and prove and uh, prove to them that I could play um, at a, a, a title challenging club like Dagenham were at that time. You know, yeah, we had yeah. some good, good players at Dagenham. Um, so I thought and there were some good players Dagenham. in that Stevenage team as well. And of course, you know, you yeah. yourself playing as a defender, you were competing and like, you know, um, amongst the yeah. likes of Luke Wilkinson, Fraser mm. Franks, Ronnie Henry... Uh, ben yeah. Wilmot as well, who's obviously gone on to, to big things now. Yeah, no, definitely, yeah. And um, I, I was I was always watching the highlights of the games just to sit and just watching the full 90 minutes of the Stevenage games just to see how how they play, how Darren Sile 
uh, liked his his defenders to, to defend. I was still training at the club once a week, even whilst I was at Dagenham. Um, okay. So I was trying to just sort of be a sponge and absorb everything whilst I could, to sort of sit back and be, you know, be vigilant and sort of have a look at how things run. Because uh, I was I was de- I was desperate to go back and and do well for the, for Stevenage. And um, uh, so yeah, I've gone to Dagenham. I've done relatively well. We, we were top of the league until the financial problem happened at Dagenham, um, which uh, ultimately cut my loan short. But, um, you know, so I was back at Stevenage for a month uh, in January. Um, I think results were up and down and um, wasn't really looking like I was going to get... I played, I think, a couple of games. I come on against Forest Green and Yeovil. Um, right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but, but then uh, sooner or later... Then, you could see yeah. they were certainly up and down, even just from those two results, because the Yeovil one, we uh, yeah. won 4-1 and then the Forest Green one, we lost 3-1. So you can see even just from that, there was... Um, a little yeah. bit of a, a lack of consistency, yeah. Yeah, definitely. And, um, you know, I think the reason I got those opportunities to even just to come on for five or ten minutes is because I, I was training well when I come back from Dagenham. Um, yeah. Had quite a bit of praise, especially from Glenn Rhoda. Again, um, I think one thing that did stick out to me, just speaking about him, um, is in training, he was very observant and very sit back and have a look but when it was time to step in he'd step in and um oh. th- there was just time i think we were doing it on a friday doing some set pieces and um i think the i, I was obviously on the bench and um the starting 11 had to de- had to defend um you know uh defending set pieces and i've gone and i've climbed above someone and i've, I've banged one in twice yeah, from, yeah. from corners and um he stopped the whole session and he said look this boy he's not getting in the team he's not been here for a while but he's attacking the ball. He's attacking the ball in the air better than everyone here. And um, you know, he just little things like that just sort of got, made me think. Ah, oh, there might be an opportunity for me here. Um, Glenn, it, of course, Glenn knows his stuff. Because Glenn's been there and, and done it oh, all as well. So yeah, because obviously I, I used to be at Norwich, um, mm-hmm. and obviously I know I know he was at Norwich previously, and he's just a big name in football. So um, it was always nice to see the likes of him and and Nicky Shorey as well. Like both of them. So, sort of giving yeah, me advice. Nicky Nick, was at Reading, wasn't he? And he played uh, yeah. the international caps, I think, as well. Yeah. Yeah, and both of them were pretty, pretty good with me. Always putting me aside and just telling me what I can do, just to sort of get into the manager's thoughts. And um, you know, up until they Darren Sar got sacked, I, I, I did believe that there might be a good opportunity for me. Um, mm-hmm. But then, when he did get sacked, it was a case of uh, you know just starting again. And initially, I was excited, thinking new manager, maybe I can sort of. You know, state my claim quite early, um, yeah. but yeah, she went the other way, and he just said that he didn't know too much about me. He had his own targets in mind, so um, it was probably best for me to move on, which I didn't take lightly because you know I was excited and I, I liked Stevenage as a club, and I thought mm-hmm. you know it could be a good opportunity for me to to have a good whole season at the club rather than go on loan and show what I'm about. Um, and going back to Dino hey, as well. The, I was going to say yeah. second major was was Dino, yeah. Yeah, it was Dino, and. Um, I think a lot of the, I think I can remember Jack King actually pulled me aside um, and he said, look, Kev, um, you, you like Dino will love you. Like he's all about hard work. He's all about no nonsense sort of graft, uh, which is me as a player. I'm just no nonsense. I'll, you know, stick my head through it. I'll put my foot through it and, you know, I won't, I won't mess about. And um, I thought Dino would be uh, the ideal manager for myself to get the best out of me. But unfortunately he didn't want to uh, take that, um, take that risk and he just thought he'd bring in his own targets in mind and um it was it was disappointing because then uh I had to I had to sort of go back to the National League having not many football league appearances under my belt I would have had to go and prove myself again which I then did with uh with Dover. That's right and of course uh, you said about Darren Sol there as well he's uh, the manager that you played under the most and of course mm-hmm. you know what was that like to, to play under him and of course you know, I'm sure you come up against him a couple of times in your, your sort of non-league day when he was at uh, when he was at Yeovil last season as well. So. Yeah, yeah, you know, I think um, I, I quite liked him as a manager. I thought he was um, he, he could be quite hit and miss with other gaffers and other people and other players. I think his personality was quite sometimes erratic and very passionate, but I quite liked that about him. Didn't have the opportunity to sort of work under him too long, but uh, every time I've sort of played against him, uh, where I was captain at Dover, I would have had a um, conversations with him in the in the referees room before games yeah. and stuff, and you know there was a, there was actually an opportunity for me to sign under him at Yeovil um, in in the summer, okay. um, and 
end during the season on loan, but um, oh. where, the lo- where the location didn't really fit um, where I'm currently at and having a daughter now, it wasn't yeah. really right. But um, but yeah, I, I, I definitely um, you know consider working under him in the future because he's he's a manager that I do quite like. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, you said about before that you were brought in at uh, a young age as well, so 21 years, uh, 21 years old. And so, what's that like for for a young player coming through into a club as well? Who's kind of, you know, you, there's quite a lot of experienced head heads there that you're competing against as well. So, what's that sort mm. of challenge like? How do how, how you sort of thrive under that pressure? Um, I tr- I try not to put too much pressure on myself. Um, I had a good, like I said, a good season at Maidstone. It's the league above. It's football league, and I've I, I had that sort of experience of being in the football league, been coming through at Norwich, and I was a pro at Colchester, albeit I didn't break through. But um, I relished it, and I, I I was excited for especially that second year to try and establish myself. Um, and obviously, it was a bit of a you know a, 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 a shake me moment when I obviously meeting Glenn Roder and Nicky Shuri and these. You know, big sort of names in football, um, yeah. but I try, I try not to let it distract me too much, or you know, sort of um, just just keep my focus. And like I said, I, I was um, just disappointed that I didn't really have that opportunity to really stake my claim at the club. Um, it's it's a local club to me. It's not too far. Uh, I'm Romford near Dagenham, which is it was obviously Stevenage, only up the up the motorway, and it's um, uh-huh. it, it, it seemed like a good fit for me. But um, you know, everything for a reason, and uh, unfortunately, it just didn't work out. And we've got a question from Matt as well, which is quite a long-winded one, so I won't really uh, bring it on screen because he might take up most of the room. But um, he says he always wonders about this. Is it um, harder to motivate yourself as a lone player than a permanent member of a club? So do you always have a voice in the back of your head reminding you that it's a temp position? Or kind of it, you can kind of flip that on your time at Stingage as well because, of course, you went out on loan hoping to come back and get some more minutes. Yeah, um, it's it is quite difficult being a lone player because you don't really know um, what to expect. Um, you, you can you're, you're only in control of how how well you play, but you're never really sure of how uh, other you know your, your parent club will look at that or um, that. But you just have to try and focus on your performances. That's all you can do. Um, in terms of like having a voice, it's quite difficult. You know. You, if you're not, you don't belong to a certain club. It's it's quite difficult to raise your opinions too much because you're not really part of the DNA or whatever it is. But um, it, it it can be difficult. But I think ultimately for me, I've always tried to see the end goal in sight, which for me was going back to Stevenage and and um, trying to do well there. Um, and in the back of my mind, I knew that I had a good season at national league level with Maidstone. Yeah. I, I knew I could do it again with Dagenham. Um, mm-hmm. I'm at a, I'm at a with all due respect to Maidstone, I was at a bigger club at Dagenham. Yeah. So it was still a progression for me, even though I was going back to the National League. I knew it was um, at a club who were challenging. Um, and like I said, we we done quite well just until the financial situation. So, um, yeah, I, you just have to stay positive when, once on loan. And it's um, it just you have to keep telling yourself what the end goal is. And that, just, for me, kept me motivated. Yeah. I know you didn't really do this in your time at Steamage, but in maybe, maybe in other parts of your career as well. When you're out on loan, then you know you, you're obviously not allowed to play against your parent club. Um, what's what's that like? So obviously, no, you're, you're not allowed to play, but then obviously you're, you're probably there, and you got you sort of heading to camp. Yeah, um, I think I've not really had that experience of having to you know, come across my parent club, but I think I wouldn't really want to uh, have that sort of because I think. I think in some contracts and some clauses you can face yeah. your parent club. That's right, um, yeah. I see that. Uh, I think at Man United when they played AC Milan the other day, that Dallo, he's on loan. That's it. He played. Yeah. Yeah. He played against yeah. Him. Yeah. Um, So it's quite it's quite a weird one. Because obviously you're probably still in group chats and stuff with both clubs, and it's just a bit of a if you then go score. I don't know. It's weird, but um, yeah, I've not had that situation. So uh, yeah. I've, not too sure how that how that'd be or how that'd feel. <laughs> That's all right. Um, and of course, you know, you said about um, you made a, a couple of appearances for the club, and you know, you're coming on against Forest Green and against Yeovil. So, just sort of tell us a little bit about those those games. Of course, you're, you're on the bench, and you know, what's the, the overriding feeling knowing that you're involved in the squad, the, the 16 or the 18, whatever it may be. Um, both times, I weren't really expecting it. Um, I think the Forest Green 
I think we were losing. Um, I think we were losing maybe three 0 I could be wrong. Three 0 four 0 I'm not too sure it was. Um, yeah. So three nil, three one, something like that. Yeah, yeah. Three one, yeah. So I've come on. Uh, I've come on at left back, um, and it was a good feeling just because I know it was, the game was gone and you know the, the result was pretty much set. But just to put a football league shirt on for the first time and play my first few minutes was a nice feeling. Um, and even that journey back home, I was still quite happy. Just the fact that I managed managed to get on the pitch, and I think every young boy's sort of dream is to play in the football league. That that was mine anyway. Um, yeah. So even those few, even those few minutes um, meant a lot to me. And I, I did say to Sarah, like Darren Sarr after the game, I said, "Look, thank you for putting me on because it's only a small amount of time, but um, it's it's appreciated, and it's my it's my debut at the end of the day. So I'm obviously I'm going to be happy." Um, and then the the Yeovil game was a weird one because I've come on. I think I've set them up actually. I've 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 tried chesting the ball back to the keeper and they've gone through and scored. But it's the same thing. I wasn't too down about it. I mean, um, prior to that, I, I was winning my headers. I was doing well. Um, yeah. A little mix up, a little mix up with me and Tom King at the back. But it happens. I wasn't too down. It was my home debut, um, and you know Darren Sell pulled me off the game. He just said, "Look, don't worry. We're winning four 0 anyway. Um, I've put you on because you've trained well. Your attitude's been good." Um, so for me, I wasn't too down about it. I was, I was still quite happy. Um, you no, know, even though those two games uh, being played, I, you know, just, 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 um, you know, really appreciated the opportunity to come on. And going back to that last question about the the loan stuff as well, uh, Matt says he's a Southampton fan, and they played Sheffield United on the last day of the season to stay up. They had Chris Lucchetti on loan from them. He was allowed to play, but chose not to in case he scored an own goal or gave away a penalty. <laughs> that's the thing as well like it could be I think, I think if you I think if you play against your parent club as well like and yeah. you, you you mess up or you do a little something you're, you're gonna get like you're gonna get abused you're gonna you're gonna get accused of sort of like you know maybe you're helping out your parent club or we're trying trying to let a goal in or whatever so um yeah that, that wouldn't sit right with me doing that <laughs> no nah, that's uh I'd probably be in the same boat as well if I was a player I'd, I'd certainly be in your shoes there I think yeah yeah. Um, so um, let's have a look on here. So, sort of, how difficult was it for you competing against? You know, we said about the likes of Luke Wilkinson and Ronnie Henry as well. Um, so, you know, of course, they're they're sort of very well known and experienced defenders. So, what was that like to to know that you had, you know you had to compete against guys like that? Um, and did you learn quite a lot of that a lot from them as well? No, definitely, I learned a lot. Um, like I said, I was training still once a week, even when, when I was at, uh, out on loan at Dagenham. And uh, yeah. when I come back, when I come back full time in January, um, you know, I, I did learn a lot. And even small things about, say, Ronnie Henry, for example, just his leadership qualities and just how he was off the pitch. Um, Luke Wilkinson, who I've played against quite a few times, just you know, just the way he hits his diags, just little things like that. And even Ben Woolmer, he's a lot younger than me, but I learned a lot from him as well. Just the fact that. Just because he's young doesn't mean he can't compete at a good level. And um, I was young at the time as well. So, um, you know, I, I looked at that and thought, look, if he's getting an opportunity, then surely next season or the end of this season, I'll get an opportunity. So you can always learn something, no matter who you come across. And that was always my outlook. And, you know, Fraser Franks as well, um, who's a, a great guy, really doing really good things at the moment as well. So there's a lot of things I could learn from these people. And, um even would turn up to games and not being in the squad or being on the bench, it's it's always important to to watch the players in your position. And I, I've taken little things from their games and other people's games who I've watched, and I still I still implement it today. So uh, was that a not, policy as well? Was it like part of club policy for if you're not involved to to go down and, and kind of support the rest of the boys, or was that something you just took upon yourself? No, it was it was it was a policy. Yeah, you have to go down and watch the boys. Um, you know, you, I think you at Stevenage, you sit up in the um, the glass, this glass bit, this sort of yeah, up yeah, in the stands. Yeah. Uh, you just watch them up there. But I think as a player, you wouldn't want it any other way, really. You just want to feel involved. And um, after the game, if there's a win or or a loss, you still go down into the change room and congratulate or whatever it is after the game. So um, mm. it's it's always good to stay as a team and just to you know keep that unity there because you never know when. Uh, you might get chucked in. Um, you, you, you need to feel like you're part of the lads and you need to be ready for the opportunity if it comes. Of course, yeah. And um, let's have a look on uh, what was I going to touch on next. Of course, you actually played alongside Alex Ravel briefly as well. 
Um, I, I don't know whether he did, whether he's going to listen to this, but he was sent off in that first game, the Forest Green game, Rebs, as well. Um, yeah. So, uh, how good a job is he doing at the moment on the back of, obviously, last season where the club didn't really know what league they were going to be in? Um, and, of course, the start of this season, preparing for start of um, the season being in the, you know, the, the National League and then now being a, a Football League club and, you know, being up there um, towards the top half as well, sort of mid-table at the moment. Yeah, am I right in saying that's his first managerial job as well? It is, is his, yeah, it is. So yeah, I think, yeah. yeah, I think um, there was a lot of talk about, obviously, Stevenage going down and when they managed to stay up, there was a lot of back chat and some sort of abuse and stuff saying you should should be going down and whatnot. But once you get told you're staying in the league, you need to focus on the mission at hand. And um, obviously, he had a bit of a, sh- uh, a slow start and uh, it was quite difficult, but doing brilliant now. Um, we played against him this season. Twice, yeah. The one of one of the games that you uh, were actually involved. In, I think you were on the bench and nil nil. And yeah, um, yeah. Uh, I know you weren't involved. What was it? Three weeks ago. Um, no. Two three weeks ago now. Yeah. Uh, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure you probably saw firsthand though, that the side was a, a sort of a, a different kettle of fish, really, compared to the start of the season to now. Yeah, definitely. They've got some good players, and um, you know, I think this league and the league below, this, I think anyone can beat anyone, and anyone that gets sort of a, a string of runs together can can do well. And um, you know, seeing Stevenage climb out of that because I think early in the season, um, you, there was no harm in saying that they're probably nailed on to, to sort of go down, and that's that was the way it was looking. But um, mm-hmm. they've done, done really well, and um, that full respect to Revs, that's his first managerial job, and he's. Um, He's come in and he's he's, he's turned turned the tide a bit, and um, it's it looks like they'll they're, they're still still clear still clear of the drop. So um, fair play to him, and hopefully he can continue that because when it's your first job, there's a lot of pressure to to do well and to 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 get that credibility as a manager. And um, you know, I think that's really good for him to 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 change things around and to to stay in the league. And there's been a lot of change on the the playing part, but there's also been a lot of change behind the scenes as well in, in his backroom team. He started off with Lenny Lawrence, uh, then the old Colchester assistant manager was there, Joe Dunn for a while, um, and yeah. now it's Dean Wilkins. So, you know, obviously he's had quite a lot of experience there to, to help him and, and guide him along the way as well. Yeah, definitely. I'm sure I'm sure he'd have his own ideas as a, as a player of how he'd be as a manager. And um, obviously, you know, having different assistants and different coaches come in isn't easy, but I think it takes it takes a strong man to to stick to his guns and to implement his uh, philosophy and and look, he, he's doing well now. So there's no, there, there can't be no complaints because um, Stevenage have, haven't really performed the way they probably would have liked to the last couple of years. Um, but to, to stay in the league is a, is a paramount and to then kick on next year, which I'm sure uh, in Rev's mind, he, he'll be looking to do to sort of get in the, those playoffs. So uh, fair play to them and hopefully uh, the only way is up for, for Stevenage going forward. Absolutely. Um, and what was it like, um, obviously, playing alongside him as, as a player as well? Uh, I just remember from, especially in training, uh, he was big, strong, good in the air, but he, he, he could move as well. He, he, was, he was a decent mover. Because um, I, I um, remember, obviously, that, that one big goal we scored for Rotherham in the playoffs, that's the one that yeah. really stands out from, what was it, 35 yards or whatever it was. He just smashes it top in. Yeah, so he, to be fair, he was a good player. And I, Obviously, with his with his age at the time, I, I wasn't assuming he'd, he'd be able to move as well as he did. And he he's a good player. He's, he he ran the channels and he was aggressive in the air. He was always difficult to mark in training, and he was a a classic sort of number nine who could score goals as well. So um, you know, I'm, I haven't seen too much of him in the past, but from the time I had with him at the training ground, uh, you know, I could I could tell he, he's had a, a good career and. Um, He's a good personality as well, so it doesn't surprise me he's doing well as a manager. Um, he was always, always very vocal, especially when, even when he first came into into uh, into the club. He, you know, he raised his opinion straight away, and he was very vocal. And um, sooner or later, he became a big character in the dressing room. And I think it takes a strong man and a strong presence to to have that sort of effect on the club as soon as they walk through the door. So, fair play to him. And that squad as well was, was a real mix of, of youth and experience, wasn't it? There was yeah. obviously the, the experience of Ronnie, who of course was the captain, and, and Rebs, and then there's the youth aspect of you know yourself and, and Ben and Luke Amos, who was in as well, who's obviously now yeah. with QPR. Um, 
Mm. And uh, who else is in there? Obviously, you know, some of the players that, that are with us now were, were involved in there as well. The likes of Joe Martin, TBC, and, and Newts as well. Yeah, yeah, to, it was a, it was a real good mix. Um, you know, especially in training, I could tell even especially the younger lads that they had some ridiculous ability. I remember like Ben Kennedy, um, Luke Amos, like these players were just really, really just quick on the ball and really sharp and. Um, you know, they, they, they look like players who can kick on and do really well. And obviously, Luke Amos has, Dan Walmart has, and doesn't surprise Matty me. Matty Godden was, Matty Godden was there or thereabouts, wasn't he, as Matt, well? Yeah. Matt, Matty Godden, which is obviously a good story. He played in non league as well, like climbing through the leads and the leagues. And he's, he's really reaping the rewards of his hard work and um, fair play to him. Uh, but there were so many good players. And I think that group of players in that squad they had at the time um, probably underachieved for, for what they had. Um, mm some really top players in there. I think Stevens probably should have tried to make the playoffs that year and obviously they would have tried to, but they probably should have with the players they had. And, um, you know, that probably led to Darren getting the sack because they had some really good individual players. But sometimes, you know, having too many individuals doesn't lead to success. But, um, you know, it's good to see a lot of those boys I just mentioned kick on and do really well now. And we've got a couple of questions to come through in the chat as well. Um, First of all, what was or is your favourite song to hear before competing? And of course, that goes to like the, the terrace as well. Of course, uh, Stephen in particular, I'm, I'm sure would have had a song for you. Um, so sorry, let's clear that question up again. Like, what song would I personally like for before a game? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, anything Drake related? Just Drake just gets me up and. Yeah, it gets me upbeat and fired up. Um, but I like and I was just saying the second part is obviously the, the terror songs as well, getting you up for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just the thing is, I try not to listen too much. I, I think I'm that sort of guy who needs to be calm before games, so I don't mm. try and hype myself up too much before games and I don't listen to too much sort of noise, whether it's from fans or whether it's sort of in the change room or whatever. I'm sort of that guy who's in my zone. Um, but yeah, I'm sure every player is different. There's, there's a different mix of personalities and different things that people like to hear before games or, you know, get them fired up during games. So, uh, but I'm quite a calm, stay in my zone, stay in my sort of element and just try and focus at the, the, the task at hand, really. Well, Drake's always a good shout. Drake always, uh, yeah. always does that. So Drake's a great yeah. artist. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and Matt again says, what's the best piece of advice you've ever been given by someone in football as well, whether that's a manager, or an older player, a coach, whatever it was? Um, oh, that's a good question. Uh, I think a very simple and vague message I received, but something that I've sort of taken into context a lot more over the years is um, the simple message of just as long as you're doing your best, you can't let things affect you too much. Um yeah. I, c I can't leave a match or leave training and be upset as long as I've given 100%. And I mm -hmm. think that's just all, all walks of life. I think if you do an exam or you do something um, that you're trying to accomplish, as long as you give it 100%, you can't you can't be disappointed in yourself because you've given it your all. Um, and that's one message I've just stuck with myself, I think. Um, that's why I've been able to do well at the likes of Dover and to get my move. And I just try and take... a um, not a laid back approach, but I try to just give my all and not be too disappointed with what happens um, after, as long as I know I've given my all. Um, I think that's just a message that we can all take and um, that, that fits with every sort of walk of life. And I, that's probably the best sort of advice I've, I've been given. It's probably from a player, I think, an older player who gave him that. It wasn't a coach. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's paramount for me just to give my all and just to accept the consequences. That's a massive message as well. Yes, it's a, a sort of very small message in terms of yeah. what was actually said, but it's huge in terms of the motivational aspect of it. Yeah, you can't beat yourself. As long as you... Anything you do, you can't control the uncontrollables. You can control what you can do, whether it's on the pitch, whether it's off the pitch. If it's off the pitch, as long as you're eating right, you're doing your prehab, you're doing your stretches, you're doing everything you can to perform on the Saturday. If you don't go on the Saturday and you have an absolute stinker, you look back at the week and you think, right, I've I've prepared right, I've eaten right, I've trained right, I've done my extras. I can't let I can't let mus I can't let myself down or I can't let myself get too disappointed for not performing. I can't let someone on Twitter piss me off because sorry, I'm not gonna say right. it, but that's, that's yeah, okay. yeah, I, I can't let someone abuse me on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram, whatever it is. I can't I can't let that get me down because I've done everything that I can and I can't control. The uncontrollables, like I said, I can't control other people's opinions. I can't control 
um, whether we win a game. I can control myself and give in 100%. And that's just something that I will always continue to do. Something I've done for the last few years and I'll continue to do it. And me speaking to young players now, that's all I'll tell them. I say, look, don't, don't, don't get yourself down. Don't, don't panic. Don't just go into the game, prepare right and do everything you can. And that's it. Simple. You can go home a happy man. You can go home to your family and still have a good night. Don't beat yourself up as long as you give it all. That's it. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, it's, a, it's a great message as well. Um, so, you know, you said about when you signed for the club, you were uh, signing in League Two. And what did you make of the club's rise up through the league? Of course, even before that, going up to League One and, you know, even on the verge of uh, promotion from League One. Of course, we were in the playoff semi-finals against Sheffield United. They were now, you know, you can kind of discount this season for them because obviously without the fans, they were a different kettle of fish again um, than what they were mm. last year. Um, yeah. But uh, you know, last year they were they were fantastic in the Premier League. They were causing shocks. Even actually, even this season to a degree, they beat Liverpool, didn't they? So yeah, yeah, I think um, that this it's always been a good setup there, and they've always sort of been a club that 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 work hard and and just get players in who who are in on the job and they know what their roles are and uh, that's testament to the man obviously the previous manager and um obviously they've got to where they are through hard work and i love that sort of club i like clubs like that i like the um i like atmospheres like that and um you know it's it's there's no surprise that they got to that level um but you know everything happens in football and there's weird things happens in football and uh unfortunately it's not happening for them this season but um, you know, I think, yeah, I think they just they deserve the success, and um, hopefully they'll get back to to that again. All right, and uh, what was it like, of course, for for a player um, playing at the the Lamnock Stadium, of course, Stevenage, and of course with that, the the buzz of the East Terrace on the match day as well. Normally about an hour beforehand, it's normally pretty busy, and you know you can hear the drum going pretty loudly, and, and everyone full voice from. Uh, Minute one, well, even before that, from about two o'clock on, was uh, sometimes even till what about half an hour after the game finished. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, it was good. Like, even the games, obviously, I was in the on the bench or just in the stand or the the, the couple of games I did play. Well, the one game at home I played. Um, you know, it was always a a, a lively atmosphere, uh, no matter what the result was or what the uh, how, how the game was going. Um, can just feel the, the stadium is very enclosed and very, yeah. you know, as the fans are right there. Um, and yeah, it's always been a club for me, a football league club. It's always been a club that, um, you know, should be doing well. And the fans, they, they come in, they come in numbers for most games back then anyway, when I was there. Um, mm -hmm. and it, it was always a bouncy atmosphere and, um, enough to get butterflies as a player to go out and try and perform for them because. When you've got people coming in numbers and they're, they've got the drums out and they're coming to enjoy a game of football and you want to always, you know, provide for them for their weekend and to to send them home happy and you just want to prove that um, you, you always want to you know, provide a good performance in front of fans like that. And that's going to be even more so now, of course, with the um, when, when fans are back in, of course, with the new stands as well behind mm. the goal there. Of course, there's a, a big... 2000 seater stands there is uh, obviously the east terrace is the, the east terrace where everybody kind of congregates and where all the, the atmosphere kind of uh, starts from and obviously the main stand is a, is a different kind of atmosphere and then the away end you know it's a, it's a very uh, modern football league stadium now. it is definitely yeah and there's um because not every club not every club in the in the um in in the football league have sort of that those plans to expand so fair play to stevenage for doing that and um you know, it should be um, with that new stand. It should be a really good atmosphere, especially when you're playing local derbies and just big clubs coming down um, on under the lights on the Tuesday night. They're the games that you can't compete with. They're, they're, the, they're the best ones. So, um, especially when the fans are back, I'm sure the Stevenage fans will come back in numbers and um, you know provide an amazing atmosphere, which which they've done in the past. And it's as a, as fans like yourselves, it should be exciting for you guys for. To come back and support the team, uh, support Revs and support the, the lads there. And um, I think one thing we can also learn is that, um, you know, we've all missed football. We've all missed watching football and turning up to games. So yeah. hopefully hopefully, when the fans do come back, they don't get on the players back too much. They just appreciate the fact that there's football going on. You can actually watch football and get behind the team and try and drive them up because that support from fans as, as a footballer, you, you um, once, once you've got the backing of the fans, you know that you can add another 5% to your game. And um, I'm sure the Stevenage fans will do that for the current boys. 
And of course, uh, at the moment, of course, um, everything's very, very different with the, the COVID pandemic, everything's up in the air. But how much as a player, you know, obviously yourself playing at Harrogate, how much do you kind of feed into the fact that there's people watching on iFollow and, you know, you might get messages even possibly from fans on social media beforehand, wishing you good luck for the, for the game and things like that. How much do you sort of feed into that and kind of get motivated through that as well? Um, yeah, I think mm, there's always going to be someone watching, even if there's no fans, there's always someone watching whether it's a video or if fans are allowed in, there's people there. So as a footballer, you're used to some form of attention and some form of viewing of your performance. Yeah. And uh, so for me, it's not much difference. Um, I think the main difference is just the the buzz of walking on the pitch when there's loads of fans there. It's so easy to get up for a game. And it's so easy to, to motivate yourself. Uh, I think when you're walking out to an empty stadium, it can be quite difficult, even though you know there's people watching at home and there's, you know, friends and family watching at home. Um, mm-hmm. that, 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 in that atmosphere that you, you know, that you walk out on, onto the pitch when there's loads of fans there, I think that's, that's the biggest motivator because they're literally right there looking at you, staring at you. Um, and it, it, it works in, it works in two different ways though, doesn't it? Of course, because yeah. from the managerial side, of course, obviously you're managed by Simon Weaver at Harrogate at the moment. So, mm-hmm. you know, he's able to get messages across him and his coaching staff a lot easier than with, the, the the fans as well, sort of, you know, the, the external yeah. factor. Yeah, definitely. You hear a lot more now. Um and you're 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 forced to communicate a lot more because there's no excuse. I think during games there can be situations where, you know, there's miscommunication, you can't hear because the fans or whatever, but now you ha- you have to communicate and you can get points across really quickly and easily. Um so and it, there's obviously some people that prefer no fans. There's there's players and there's managers who you know, maybe aren't doing as well. They haven't got that pressure of fans behind you in the, in the stands, sort of, you know, calling you all sorts of names under the sun. Um, yeah. So a lot of players and managers will probably prefer the current settings, but ultimately football is a game for the fans. And it's um, what we all hope that the fans come back because there's no better feeling, whether it's positive or negative, of just performing in front of people. And, um, you know, it brings out the best in me personally anyway. I'm not sure about other people, but uh, for me, I, I can't wait to have them back. I think it's quite interesting because when I watch the I follow um, stream for the Stevens games, it's you know you can hear Dean Wilkins really. D- Dean is a big shouter. Dean, he, he's very passionate. You can hear him going at the referees or you know the, mm. the players, whatever it may be. Um, yeah. It's something that when you see that first time, like it's, it's going to be really interesting to see whether he's the same kind of character when there's fans there. I think when you're playing on the pitch, I think your per- regardless of fans or not, I think. Your personality comes out. There's not there's not enough time to think about. Oh, maybe I shouldn't say this because of this, or maybe I shouldn't say that. I think when someone's so passionate like that, I think that's probably just their DNA, and they probably just yeah. you know, regardless of fans or not. Um, so yeah, I'm sure that'll continue. And um, you know, yeah, a, 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 you, as fans, I think you can understand a lot more. You can hear a lot more on the pitch, and it's probably quite interesting as fans to to see what people are saying, what managers are shouting across the pitch, and actually what goes on because a lot of people won't actually understand or hear the sort of communication that's used on the pitch. So it's probably quite uh, interesting for cer- certain fans uh, to to really hear firsthand what, um, what's being said, you know. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, I quite enjoy that, that aspect of it and that it's, it's a mm. different factor of it than, than, of course, being in the stand or, and supporting through that. Um, but uh, yeah, of course, there's no better buzz than being in the stand and, or on the terrace and, and supporting the boys there firsthand, of course. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, hundred um, percent. Like I said, hopefully it's not too long now until fans are getting in and um, get that buzz back about football because it's, it's it's not easy as a footballer now playing with no fans. It's it's really not easy. <laughs> it's um, it's quite it's quite. Yeah, it's quite demotivating sometimes walking out. There you go. Matt's kind of, kind of proved my point. He said, or oh, kind of proved your yeah. point, actually, I should say. Sorry. Uh, he says that he's a Southampton fan, as we mentioned earlier. They used to hear Dean, Wilkin, uh, Dean Wilkins on the terraces, even with the fans. When he was assistant manager there, he used to bark instructions in a T-shirt and shorts in all weather. So that's obviously just what Dean's like. There you go. There you yeah. go. Yeah. Like, like, like I said, you can't, you can't fake that... Um, you can't fake that emotion on the pitch. I think, I think even more so if you're doing it when there's an empty state, empty stadium, you're going to do it even more so when there's a packed stadium because that extra bars and that extra, that extra fire from having the atmosphere. So yeah, exactly. 
Uh, and of course, uh, we touched on the, the games that you were on the bench about um, a little while ago. Uh, so who did you support growing up? And sort of who were your role models and your own sort of personal inspirations as well? Um, so I was always, my glory team was always Man United. Uh, right. My local my local team's West Ham, so yeah. I've admired both. It was more so Man United because they were winning loads of things and stuff. And as a young kid, I've always sort of supported Man United. But um, yeah, for me, like many other centre-backs, it was Rio Ferdinand uh, as a player. Just had the full package. He was a London boy like me. Um, he, he was just the ultimate centre-half. And he's the reason why I enjoy playing centre-half because initially I didn't enjoy it. Everyone wants to be an attacker or striker or whatever. But once I started watching him, um, himself and Vincent Company, these sort yeah. of players who who were proper animals and beasts and comfortable on the ball, and it made me actually enjoy the fact that you can play centre half and you can, you know, you can make a big difference and you can, you know, really enjoy that position. Because yeah, when you when you're young, everyone just wants to score goals and um, and stuff like that. But they're, they're the two. Um, you know, pers personal favourites of mine in my position that inspired me. Okay, that's uh, two fantastic answers there with, with Rio and, and Vincent Company as well. Both yeah. very decorated players that have won all sorts really as well. And I follow Arsenal a little bit and one of mine, you know, I used to really like the centre-back partnership of Keogh and Tony Adams and Tony Adams <laughs> in particular as a captain. Yeah. I thought Tony Adams was excellent. Yeah, definitely. I mean... I didn't first hand. I didn't see too much of him, but everyone knows Tony Adams and Martin Keown, and I'm sure I've I've watched many clips on those two, and so no nonsense. So, uh, and to to hear about what especially Tony Adams was doing off the pitch, and for him to perform as well as he did on the pitch, it yes. just it makes you think how good he would have been if he didn't have the problems that he had. Mm -hmm. um, so it's yeah, they're, they're the sort of defenders that I personally. Um, admire the most just very no nonsense very shut sharp shop and sort of keep just make sure the, the goals are not going in and just let the forward players do their thing and uh their leaders their vocal and that's the sort of way i like to play to to really use presence and no nonsense attitude and um, we've got another question there as well from uh Giggsy. what one word do you feel describes you as, as a player i guess as well um committed as as a one word committed that's okay. that's me uh yeah whether that's a whether that's a game as a whole whether it's a challenge whether it's a header whether it's a pass i'll just commit myself and like i said it doesn't always come off and it doesn't always work but i'm fully committed to every game every session every moment of the game fully committed so that could be my little my little thing now. Committed. That's a good little, <laughs> good little uh, motto to have, not just for the way you play, but for for life as well. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. Like I said, yeah, definitely. As long as you commit yourself and the player yourself, then you're you're good to go, and you you'll reap the rewards, whether it's now Absolutely. or later on. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um. So we've only got a few more to get through now. Um. So of course, you know, you were on the bench for Harrogate against Stephen earlier on the, in the season, which we touched on as well. Um. So what was that like to to obviously? You know, it's a, it's a former club of yours. Um, did you still know anyone around the club? Obviously, did you did you speak to Revs at all? Or? Yeah, um, didn't speak to Revs. I just had, uh, when I was warming up, I gave him a little nod, but that was it. There was, there was no conversation there, I think. Um, just sort of focus on the game. Uh, I know Inny Effion really well, just for obviously being at Dover with Inny. Yeah, and of course, um, he, uh, he was with us at the time. He's out on loan at the moment with uh, North yeah. County. But he's doing well at County as well. He is, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, speak to him nearly daily now and um you know I'm, I'm i'm glad for him to to go out and get some games and at a big club like Notts county and hopefully that doesn't does him well for whatever happens whether it's at stevenage or elsewhere i think he's done well enough to to get a decent club or or to hopefully get a new, de new deal but who knows what, what happens um but yeah no i didn't really speak to too many people um check the team's changed quite a lot since i was there so yeah um apart from revs and uh terence i spoke to actually before the game terence van Kooten, mm -hmm. Um, but apart from that, that was it really. A lot, a lot of new faces, and um, you know, just just trying to focus on the game. And but uh, it was a it was a tough match, and it was a quite evenly contested uh, sort of game. Um, but yeah, and both games were even the game down here as well. You know, you were, your mm. boys Harrogate were very much in it as well, and it was only a, a one 0 scoreline, which of course you were on the wrong side of on that day. But um, yeah. you, you know, I, I heard your. I think it was. Um, one of your forwards come out and said that you, you know, Harrogate played played worse in one game. So, 
Yeah, that's, that's 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 the thing with football. You can play really well and you can you can come off disappointed, or you know you could uh, be out the game for the majority of the game and you can nick him one nil. But um, I think that's what you guys done. Um, you know, it was a, a long ball over the top, and unfortunately, our defender didn't. You know, he miscontrolled it, and fair play to the boy. He, he went and went through and finished it. Um, it was a good finish, and uh, but that happens in League Two, especially. You know, you can you can be in the game, and you can and you can be out of it. It's, you can nick one nils. They're probably the best ones as a as a as a player when you nick one nil like that, a little snatch and grab. Uh, so. Yeah, and Listy, who scored the goal, is, is one of the ones that I actually, you know, me and Listy talk a bit as well because he, he um, streams on Twitch alongside Tom Pat. They, he also streams as well, so mm. I, I, I sort of talk to those. I talk to Coco as well, Ben Coco. So those three are guys that obviously I, I know a little bit about, and, and we discuss. You know, we, we have a chat normally after games, me just or before games sometimes as well. Yeah, yeah, no, it's good. Yeah, two fair Tom Pat as well. Actually, he. Um, uh, I, I was at Stevenage. He was there initially. He, he's done well as well for him to come through non-league and to, to come to to do really well at Stevenage in his first stint and go Lincoln done quite well and now he's back. Um, so yeah, he's another one and um, it's just good to see these sort of boys still in the football league and and playing well. Um, yeah, like I said, that yeah, um, there's many games like that where it's nil nil for the majority of the game and then the boy who was rapid that listy he, he looked rapid and he's gone through and he's finished it well so fair play he was in good form at that point as well he, was, he scored a couple just before that um in games before that and i think he scored one or two in games after that as well and yeah. he's uh the the main man really at the moment in terms of finding the back of the net um yeah yeah there's a couple of others of course in there as well that, that obviously do a job but yeah you shouldn't be giving away secrets of the club i suppose <laughs> <laughs> too fair we do enough analysis to know all this anyways <laughs> <laughs> but now, what have you made of the uh, the work that the club have done during the pandemic as well? Of course, today is uh, is a year on since the um, the sandwich deliveries and all that coming to into place. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a year today, yeah. Yeah, no, it's good. I think a lot of football clubs uh, have done their fair bit, and it's it's good to see. Um, so you know, everyone's got to help out. Everyone that's in the fortunate enough position, like you and me, who are you know doing okay, and we're still here. We're still eating and living and so everyone's got to do their part and it's good to see football clubs who who can really make an effect uh do that so uh you know it's good for stevenage it's good for community it's good for everyone um if every every little helps and the the packages that people send out the food food deliveries and all that sort of thing it's um it all makes a big difference and um as long as we can put smiles on faces that's the most important thing and of course, I'm sure with, with Harrogate, I'm, I'm pretty sure Harrogate are in the same kind of boat as Steamish as well, mm. um, competing with, you know, of course, Leeds and Sheffield United and, uh, you know, Sheffield Wednesday, Rotherham. Um, and in terms of, you know, other um, clubs, I'm not really sure, Barnsley possibly as well, in, in terms of, uh, you know, and, and Doncaster, in fact, is another one as well, uh, getting the fans through the door. So what's that like to, to know that, you know, obviously... You know the fans that turn out for you are, are very loyal, passionate fans, and they're they're going to be there week in, week out. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> um, you know, there's so many big clubs around, so the ones that do come to the Harrogate games, rather than you know, the big stadiums like Leeds and Sheffield Wednesdays and you know the Barnsleys, that they're they're definitely loyal fans, and they're you know they come they come in numbers up here in Harrogate, um, and similar to Stevenage, so many big clubs around, but the ones that do come, you know, they're loyal fans, and they they want the clubs to do well. Um, so, you know, I'm sure we can both speak for both our clubs that, you know, we're both looking forward to the fans coming in because um, just just for the fact that for them, for their sakes, their own mental health and their own, you know, their, their sort of pride and joy of watching the football on the weekend um, has been taken away. And, um, you know, I just hope that it's sooner rather than later. Um, and does that uh, motivate, not, not motivate, I suppose, is the wrong word to use, but... Um, of course, you know, for, for teams like Harrogate and, and even Steamage as well, um, to get out into the, to the community a lot more, I suppose motivation probably is the right word, in fact, yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think currently right now, Harrogate would do like Zoom calls and uh, different player appearances and stuff just to keep in touch with the community. Because um, I think sometimes as a player, you can not forget, but maybe not realise the, the effect that you as a player, as a professional footballer, um, Albeit being in League Two and in the lower leagues, you know you have an effect on 
on kids and and even adults who 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 love the club and who love the game. So it's important to stay in contact, to stay in touch, and to to connect with you know your local community because uh, one little call, one little conversation, whether it's on social media or Zoom or wherever it is, it, it can actually brighten up their spirits and um, you know help them you know just enjoy football even though that th- they can't come to the game. So it's so important and it, it, these it's these little things that make a big, big difference and that's that's something I've learned over the past year especially that, that the small touches and small little moments of um, of connections with people can actually during these times make a massive difference. And of course, you know, you said about the mental health there as well for uh, the fans. Of course, it's going to be great for the players when the fans are back in, uh, back in as well because that's going to, mm. you know, the, the mentality of players is going to be different. And how important is that to have somebody there that, you know, do you have somebody at Harrogate who deals with the mental health side of it as well? Or is there somebody that, you know, knows yeah. that, that kind of side of it? Yeah, we've got someone who's uh, dedicated just, just for that. He's a psychologist who we can reach out to. Uh, which is very useful, um, especially if you're not playing or just anything off the pitch. It, could, it might be something completely relevant to football, um, which is very helpful because we all have our struggles. We all have our, yeah. you know, moments that we we were struggling and we need that help. And uh, it's good to have that support there. Um, obviously, you've got the PFA there as well, who who I've actively used. In, in I'm not no shame in saying it. I've actively used them to to discuss some problems and discuss some 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 issues and um it's it's all good it's all it's all helpful it's going in, in a better direction than it was in the past still a lot of work to do but um as long as there's that platform for players to speak to and and not just players and people outside of football and etc and fans or whatnot uh, as long as there's that access to to communicate with someone and to get that help then it's um it's better days ahead and hopefully it continues that way hopefully now that once the pandemic comes to an end, that mm. sort of mental health side, it's important for that not to go out the window because it can yeah. be easy now to say cinemas are open, you know, football, you know, football games are, you know, you can go and watch a game like, you know, everyone should be fine now. And that's not going to be the case. Some people will still struggle and some people will still need that help because adjusting to being back and out in the real in the real world can, um, with things open again, that can in itself be a, a struggle. So hopefully it's um, it's still talked about as much as it is now. Yeah, I'm sure it will be as well, and I'm sure that they'll probably put a, a little bit of extra into it as well at the very beginning to make sure of, of that kind of situation. And, you know, even with kids going back to school, etc., in the last few weeks, I'm sure they would have uh, had that kind of mental health aspect of it looked at quite, you know, in detail and quite uh, in depth. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, and that's another one, kids as well at schools. Like, they're missing out on so much and, um, you know, there's so much room for them and time for them to to learn and develop but a bit of them being indoors all this time it, it can't be good for them so um so yeah it's it's important that, that this just stays in place and uh, as much help as possible is given that's all right mate um we're probably going to wrap it up in a moment just want to get through maybe uh one more question really so um you know of course you're still involved in harrogate and, and the playing capacity at the moment and have you learned any further, you know, later down you, into your career about would you ever become a, you know, a coach? Would you ever want to get into management, anything like that? Um, something I've thought about quite a lot. Um, it's I, I'd, I'd like to stay in the game in some capacity, whether it's being a coach or a mentor, um, on a part-time level. So maybe a, a some sort of mentor for players, or but or coach maybe like in my own time, one one on one coaching. But I think for me, I've always had the interest of completely not leaving football, but pursuing something completely different. That's that's probably my my. Um, you know, I've been in football for such a long time. It'd be nice for me to, to explore different things, and that's probably my my next steps. I reckon it probably be away from football for a while, but also maintaining contacts and helping those who who might need it. Yeah, that's great as well. So to have that kind of uh, you know two different you know you sort of uh, hands in two different pies, I suppose two different kind of different avenues of looking at. Um, yeah. So uh, we're gonna wrap it up there. I think actually, Kev. So thank you very yeah. much for joining today. It's been just about an hour long, so. Uh, Hopefully, uh, people have enjoyed it as well. And uh, best of luck for the rest of the season with Harrogate. I can say that because we played you twice now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, hopefully, you can uh, yeah get, get a couple of good results and cement your size place in the Football League like Steams are doing right now as well. Yeah, definitely. But no, I appreciate the chat and um, all the best to you in whatever you're doing in your interviews. And 
and all the best to Stevenage as well in what their in what their ambitions are this season. All right, nice one. Thanks a lot. Um, enjoy the rest of your day, mate. Cheers. Oh man, Andrew. Cheers, mate. Thank you. Nice one. Thanks a lot. Bye now. Cheers. Bye. Bye. bye.